Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's real. It doesn't worry. Some of them, it's hard. Like, some of them are really long times. Because I was at, they don't fit on the um, A4 sheets. Mm-hmm. I'll just do the largest Tasmanian acknowledgement of Tasmanian's Aboriginal peoples. We acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional custodians of this land. And we pay our respects to rulers past, present, and future who hold the memories, traditions, culture, and hope of Tasmanian's first peoples. Lobby Tasmania also pays respect to the resilience and strength of the Tasmanian Aboriginal people and extends that respect to all First Australian peoples. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. And I will be back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me here today. Thank you for coming. When the Army sent detachments of regiments out to the Van Diemen's Land as convict guards, a few families came. Only about 10% of the men, and I'm sure most of them were officers, um, were allowed to bring their wives and family with them. And it was on the next available ship, as the case may be, not always on the same ship. I'm sure that some of these men, some of them were widowers, may have married or remarried here. Some remained here, transferring regiments when their tour of duty ceased. Certainly there were military personnel who resigned their positions or were pensioned off and remained here. They were often known as pensioners and even even military pensioners. This talk is not really about those people. Um, I'm talking about pensioners, not the old age pension either. Um, The the old age pension didn't come into existence until several years after Federation, about 1908. Military pensioners were also known as Chelsea pensioners, enrolled pensioner force or veterans. This talk is more about these people. There were soldiers who served in the British Army and who had been granted an army pension through disability or having completed full service. Once they discharged from the army, their papers were held by the Royal Hospital Chelsea who administered their pensions, thus they were known as Chelsea pensioners. Though those from Ireland and whose records were held by the Royal Hospital Kilmainham were also included. The first group of pensioners arrived here in 1826-27 and that was only 63 veterans and their families. Conditional that they, these were not too numerous, not the children were not too numerous. Only, although only 43 remain as permanent settlers. They were sent to various parts of the island, including Georgetown, Swansea, Brighton, the Clyde or Bothell district, and Hugh and Birch's Bay settlements. Some were overseas on public works, supervising Whoops, sorry. We've got a funny little um, Sign up here, Clifford. That's no, gone now, it's all right. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, some of these were overseers on public works, supervising convicts while others became mounted police. Some have been researched by Gwenda Webb and she has identified those who settled at Westbury. In 1832, another group of 109 Chelsea pensioners with at least 51 wives and 53 children arrived. It is not known exactly where these people settled. Throughout the colony, some were sent to Port Malden in Ontario, Canada. This was the scene of the Upper Canadian Rebellion of 1837-39 and British troop troops were sent to the fort to repel attacks by rebels and their American sympathisers. And of course, some of those men were sent here. Enrolled pensioners, retired soldiers, were sent there to, uh, sent there from 1851 to 1858. The governor in the late 1830s, of course, was George Arthur, once Lieutenant Governor of Tasmania. 
And those convicted and sentenced were sent here to Van Diemen's Land and New South Wales and are known as the Canadian Exile. So Arthur went from here to Canada. <coughs> Um, in New Zealand, they were, there was a similar group, and they were called the Royal New Zealand Defensible Corps. And they were sent, sent to help settle some of the unrest between the Maoris and the settlers of North Auckland. They left the British Isles 1845 to 53, arriving in 10 ships with 721 pensioners, 632 women, and 1,228 children. And they were listed by the War Office as embarking on, oh yeah, the were ten chips. So that group went to New Zealand, quite a large group. In 1850, as part of its emigration policy, the home government in England began to send out parties of military pensioners to Australia. And by 1864, when the policy ended, the influx of pensioners and their family had resulted in an increase in the Western Australian population of over 2,000. And the numbers for Van Diemen's land are on the bottom of that slide. And it's just a population of Tasmania. 527 military pensioner guards, 427 wives, 667 children, making a total of 1,621 people. They came on these ships, can you see them? They're not clear enough. The Eliza, the Blenheim, the Maori Simons, and you can see the number of, um, the first, next column is the number of pensioners, 72 on the Eliza was the most, 54 children, 70, uh, 54 women, 77 children, 9 died and 19 men left the colony. So there's the Eliza, the Blenheim, 1, Mariah Soames, Lola, William Jardine, Rodney 1, Hyderabad, London, Lady Kenaway, Cornwall, Blenheim, Rodney, Abakir. Peston G. Bamanji, Alfairly, Peston G. Bamanji, Lord Dalhousie, Bangalore, and we did get three from Western Australia in 1856. They were supposed to be not over the age of 45, number of children not to exceed two under seven years, three under ten years, or ten unspecified as they could be of service in the colony. They were old enough to be put to work. Wives and family, members allowed to travel in the same ship if accommodation was available, otherwise the next ship. Travel at public expense, both to the port of embarkation and ship. Pension is to serve for six months or until the termination of the voyage. Uh, payment from the, the departure from the respective districts continued on shipboard in the colony till period of engagement expired. Rates of pay per day, private one and threepence, corporal one and sixpence, sergeant one and tenpence. to the numbers of, arri in a, of arrival, I said there was over 1,600. Um, in 1993, Tasmania only received 920 refugees. Um, 1995, 240 Vietnamese and 356 Hmong. For the years, for the eight years following 1947, 3,500 people arrived from Holland. A few thousand Italians arrived in Tasmania to work mainly in the hydro scare. From 1947, 1,500 Poles 
along with Germans and Italians and other similar groups of Europeans, worked in the construction of the new homodrome. So the number that came in, if they were all adults, the same as the number that came in to help with the homodrome scheme in the um, 1950s. On board the ship Blenheim was John Kennedy, his wife Mary Maloney, Luke Finn and his wife Catherine Maloney, James Leary and his wife Eliza Maloney. And these wives and sisters on, were on board were these wives were sisters and on board were another two of their unmarried sisters. Only Bridget has been identified. Um, the wives and children of pensioners travelled without payment, but payment was required for the two sisters, so the two sisters had to pay to come out. The five sisters were fortunate to be able to travel together. Uh, the uniform was supplied, worn on duty, consisting of a blue surcoat or frock coat, similar to that of the French infantry, one shell jacket, in other words a pink one. Apparently the word shell is a very old term used for pink. Um, a pair of trousers and a cap, which were to be worn on duty. In the event of serving as an enrolled pensioner, the collar in the colony, the uniform was to be replaced as required. The usual arms and equipments were issued to, and they were to be marked and numbered as belonging to the pensioner. Oh, okay. Mr. Every pensioner was, during the period for which, for which he was engaged or enrolled, subject to the provision of the Mutiny Act and Articles of War. While thus enrolled, he was allowed one guinea to cover the expense of the funeral if he died. Luke Jennings, who arrived, arrived from the Rodney, was notified in July, 1950, July 1850 to take his wife Catherine, Catherine and, two, and five children from Galway, County and report to the staff officer at Limerick. From here, they were directed with other families to catch a train to Dublin. It's interesting to know the way they travelled. His instructions were to cross to Liverpool, then travel by train to Tilbury Fort at London. Tilbury Fort was a military staging post where various groups of guards and their families were assembled prior to embarkation on their respective <coughs> convict ships as and when they required. These men served as guards on the convict ships. After arrival in the colony, the enrolled pension was subject to attend exercises, 12, a 12 days exercise in any local company to be formed in the colony or when called out for the preservation of the peace under the governor. When thus called upon, the rate of payment increased to two shillings sixpence for the privates and proportionally for corporals and sergeants. Although at the end of six months the pensioner's engagement was considered to be terminated, he was still bound to register his place of abode and was not and was not to move without obtaining permission to do so. And that's a map of some of the towns they were settled in. Clarence, Brighton, Pontville, Kempton, which is Great Ponds, Richmond, Colebrook, earlier Jerusalem, in the districts of Yarlington and Spring Hill Bottom, Oakens, Campbelltown, Evandale, Longford, Avoca, 
Bingo, Rocky Hills, Swansea. I back down south to Agnes River or Signet or Port Signet, Franklin, and Gordon. At least eight of the pensioners were, went for a short time to Norfolk Island as constables or overseers. Some of the towns had their pension and veterans rose. West, Westbury had both and is the only town where they still remain. Likewise, Five Acre Road is another of the streets still to be found in Westbury and alludes to the size of the majority of the pensioners' allotments in this town. Gordon had its pensioners' point on the shore of the Dontracosto Channel. It was here near Gordon Jetty that the first bricks were made out of clay. It was also known as Three Hut Point. Two huts built for each of the two single police stations there, and the third hut for their lifeboat used to travel. Those who remained in Hobart were thought to have been mechanics and artisans. The largest group of over 80 pensioners were established in the Westbury district, and it's, this is well documented by the local history society there. That's, um, I was clever enough to do this pie chart ages ago. I don't think I could do it again. <laughs> but anyway, just gives you an, an approximation of the different sizes. And then the numbers, West B87 and Clarence 2 and the down only 3. So the figures on the right hand side are all single numbers, all 287 lines. And this is going seven years later. Um, the proportion then, 1859. Westbury, they had 150, 35% of the total. At first, the pensioners and their families were expected to supply the demand for labour rather than attempt to settle it on the on their land of their own. It was hoped that they would merge into the existing population and support themselves. Only if they were able, unable to do so, then the colonial office suggested that they be used on the public works for the maximum of six months. No land grant was promised them, but if they acquired money to purchase land in the interior, they would be there would be no objection to their settling on their land, even though the distance might prevent them from serving as enrolled pensioners. It was expected that they were, if they were called up, that they would be placed under the general or superior officer in command of Her Majesty's forces in the colony, in the same manner as if they formed part of the regular forces of Her Majesty's army. In this capacity, in 1851, several contingents were formed from them to serve in rotation on the gold fields where some of the were involved with the Eureka stockade in, and of course in, that's in Victoria. Um, well, I've got this a bit out of order, I think. By December 1850, a total of 222 pensioners had arrived and the barrack was hired for their immediate accommodation, at least for a short time. The barracks in Hobart Town was the building on the wharf we now know as the Drunken Admiral. Do we all know where that is? Mm -hmm. A large warehouse was erected during 1825-26 as a substantial brick building with a stone facade and a roof with Scottish slate. It consisted of four storerooms, two offices, a sample room, and three bedroom flat. In 1828, the building was leased as an ordnance store. Major structural repairs occurred in the 1830s to the walls due to the weight of the stored goods causing the building to sink. And of course, it was probably built on the reclaimed land. The ordnance corps vacated the building in 1849 and it was used as a depot and temporary accommodation for military pensioners. Such was their gratitude and discipline, they eventually had to be evicted and the building was described as being in a disgraceful state of filth and disrepair. 
It needed considerable renovation before being handed up to the Immigration Association as an immigrant depot in 1851. The building then consisted of two large flat storerooms and dormitory accommodation for 190 people. It was prepared by the Immigration Association for the arrival of the Bueller girls. Girls from Ireland, I think, um, single girls. 203 souls, including 162 single Irish girls. And that was the Duncan Out a couple of years ago and hasn't changed much now. Some pensioners sought to settle on the land at once but found they could not obtain employment nearby, wrongly thinking it would be more advantageous than labouring as mechanics and servants. The established settlers preferred to hire convicts because that was cheaper, and soon some of these pensioners were discontent with their lot and soon began petitioning the war office. This resulted in them being settled over a very wide, wide, very wide area, subject to labour requirements. Soon after their arrival, the pensioners moved to various towns. They were settled on small allotments, two to ten acres, preferably in groups of full company. Since they were used to army living, <coughs> these blocks were close to a principal town or location to enable them to get work. After seven years of residency, the land was theirs. The allotments had to be within reach of schooling for their children, divine worship and religious instruction. Those pensioners who arrived per Eliza, the first ship to be sent, have the best records for any ship. A listing dated May 1850 notes their religion, their age. They're all X years and five and 12 months, so Presumably their age was taken at the 1st of January, but recorded when they, when they arrived as such and such in five, 12 months. If married, um, with the record, they were recorded if they were married, number, sex, and age of children. Also available for them is the cost from the colonial treasure of car, that's car carriage, hire the conveyance of their baggage to some of the towns. Those to whom land had been granted were soon settled on it. Occupancy of the land was subject to conditions and a notice warning of letting, leasing or any other alienation of the land without sanction of the lieutenant governor, which could result in forfeiture, was posted in the Hobart Town Gazette January 1852. Only Luke Jennings and Patrick Lawler remained at Rocky Hills and received titles of their land being, becoming valid 9th of December 1857. Luke didn't ask the government help to build his house. He moved into one of the buildings nearby on the old probation station, not his own grant. In 1860, most of the buildings of the probation station were auctioned off. Luke bought the one that he was, in which he was living. He then asked the government to either grant him the land the house stood on or give him £15 he was entitled to so he could move the house to his own land. The government decided to give him the money and was paid on the 7th of April 1860. The house occupied and bought by Luke was originally the officer's quarters being built from stone, as you would expect. It, it was never moved from the original site, so he got paid for it and he went into it, stayed in it. Luke and Catherine lived there until their deaths. She died just prior to 1900. Some descendants remain in the district, others are known to have gone to New Zealand. And of course, the Rocky Hills Probation Station is a little bit south of Swansea. Um, there's a map from Swansea, uh, from Richmond somewhere, that marks the pensioner allotments. But it's, they're not strictly where that arrow is up the top. They're more along um, where they I mark them actually on there, where everyone was. And 
in Shaw Street. They, they seem to be around Shaw Street. And the next one, Parable on that's right in Worcester Shaw. Records of other settlements are available. 84 blocks have been allotted at Oatlands by November 1852. Although at the time, four lots had been withdrawn and 38 were still vacant. The land was situated on the south of the main Oatlands Township, bordering on the lakes, on the shores of Lake Dolberton. These land grants were situated in two blocks, Lake Queen, Lake Queen Anne, Hay, Wild Yates and Foster Streets, and Lake Dolberton around the first lot, Henrietta Street, Louisa, Foster, Henry Street and Veterans Row, and the second block. The land here has been described as light and sandy soil. Mark Point on the um, on Lake Darlington commemorates one of the pensioners. Mark Point is close to the town end of the church Chatham Street, Chatham Street, on the town boundary. Another pensioner is remembered in the name of Bennett Corner. And that's on the Little Swan Port Road. Dennis Marr and Patrick Mannion both arrived by the ship Cornwall in June 1851. Pat Mannion, or Mannon, was first granted land at Rocky Hill, so they changed their own a bit. Pensioners Waterhole is found at Lake Dalberton, and it's thought that pensioners dug this hole to get water at times of drought. The pensioners of Gordon are remembered by Pensioners Point, which is, was here. As I said before, the new, near the Gordon jetties, the first bricks were made out of clay. Towards the end of 1851, Lieutenant Governor Charles La Trobe applied to the government in Van Diemen's Land for military aid. After consideration, it was decided not advisable to send any of Her Majesty's troops and suggested that need could be met from the enrolled pensioners who might volunteer for service. The number was not to exceed 200 effective non-commissioned officers and privates. And that's a little bit I found. It's in the Tas Ancestry, Journal of the Tasman Family History Society. And they are now online if you go through the main website. There was a nominal list printed. And you probably can't, can you read any of those names? Yeah. Barely. Mm -hmm. But that list is in that journal. And it goes on to the E to J's. I've missed a page. Because that's hard to do. Sorry. Um, the, that list is also from a CSO, if you want to make a note. CSO 24, 185, pages 53 to 57. And um, the Tasmanian Name Index does have the military pensioners where none listed, but there is, the reference is there, but the, there's not a link yet. I was going to speak to Sandra about that again. Conditions for pensioners to Victoria. They had to proceed to Hobart Town and report to the staff officer, and each pensioner on arrival was contracted for service to bear arms for a period not exceeding 12 months and acknowledged of being subject to the Mutiny, Mutiny Act and the Articles of War. On enrolment, the costs of travel to Hobart were reimbursed. Um, by February 1852, 150 pensioners had volunteered, being fitted out with uniforms and emb embarked for Victoria. Many of them were Irish, and about half of them could not sign their names. They were warned that they were not able to proceed if they had any outstanding debts. Although originally from many different regiments, the men are under the command of Captain Blamey of the 99th Regiment and were sent as part of the military force to help 
with problems in Ballarat that culminated with the Eurekis uprising over 150 years ago. Um, more of the conditions, they received as an enrolment five pounds to expend on certain assessor, 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 I'm gonna leave that, the shirt socks, etc. The pay of the pensioners serving to be as follows. Sergeant Major, 11 shillings per day. Sergeant, 7 shillings. Corporal, 5, five shillings. That's per day, that's how small I a month. Mm. While under arms, every pensioner to, to motion clothed and housed in the same manner as Her Majesty's regular troops. As it was impractical for wives and family to accompany the pensioner, Authority was given for their pensioners and additional allowances to be paid to the wife family for support. Cultivation of their land and saving his crop at a rate of a shilling per day to the wives and sixpence to each child under 12. Those without wives and family to receive a shilling a day while absent from their allotments. Such money to be used under the direction of the police or assistant police magistrates in the protection of his property and cultivation of the ground. Um, when the forces disbanded, the cost of return travel to Hobart, um, from Hobart to residents were reimbursed. The officers serving with the force to receive a pound a day with all the usual allowances for travelling and lodge money, the lodging money to which his rent may entitle to him. Military pensioners residing in Van Diemen's Land or Victoria who are not enrolled and have not served as convict guards volunteering for this service to be subject to the same conditions with respect to their families as those who have. Any pensioner deserting or being discharged for misconduct, his name will be submitted to the Secretary of War with a view of stoppage of his pension and he will forfeit his land and cottage with no claims on the colonies of Van Diemen's Land. It was expected that the men would only be needed for an initial period to fill the gaps in the shortage of guards, a Pentridge prison, government house, treasury, gold escort, peacekeepers on the gold fields of Mount Alexander, Castlemaine and Bendigo, where their tent barracks were situated in March 1852. The quality of rations and housing was found to be insufficient. Private John Donahue or Donahoe was suffering from scurvy in November of 1852. He was discharged medically unfit and so authorised to collect a gratuity equal to one month's pay, although it was stated as part of the conditions of, not stated as a part of the conditions of the employment. He died in Signet in July 1853, which is eight months later. Similarly, the following month, Corporal John McGovern X 27th Regiment was suffering from scurvy. Although he was granted land at Fingal, an allotment at Westbury in his name has been listed as abandoned a year later in 1858. He appears to have gone to Victoria and died there in 1867. The clothing issue was completely unserviceable for use in the summer months, and with the heat of February and March unbearable for, for active duty, the lighter clothing was substituted. The black cloth trousers were replaced with a pair of duck or some light material. The black leather cap was changed to a cabbage tree hat, and the VR on the ribbon and a blue frock coat was replaced with blue serge with red facings. Anyone know what a cabbage tree hat is? Mm. No, woven from fronds of a cabbage tree. Martin Cash actually used to make those and sell them. Um, the cabbage tree palms uh, in subtropical on the mainland. I used to get them, plait them, and then uh, make them into a hat. I like, I like a straw hat, a straw bonnet. 
A series of reports exist concerning the 150 volunteer pensions dispatched from Hobart Town for military service in January 1852. Luke Jennings from Rocky Hills was amongst this number, as well as Patrick Manning. Some men are particularly listed for different reasons. Primus Thomas Hawkins was a drunk on guard duty at Pentridge Stockade on the 16th of March. Private Thomas Sweeney, formerly of the East India Company, also drunk on sentry duty at Government House, 16th of March. Private Michael Shee, drunk on reporting for duty on the 15th of March. Private Owen Johnson, pulmonary disease, discharged discharge to BDL, May 3rd and deceased by September 1857. The following six men, all private, were all recorded as being medically unfit for active service on the 1st of April 1852, and they were to be returned to Van Diemen's Land. But before leaving, it was proposed that they should receive a gratuity of one month's pay and the cost of their return to Van Diemen's Land. James Gillespie died from drop, dropsy at Westbury in 1853, aged 44. Thomas Hawkins of the East India Company, Frank, Francis McCain, Patrick MacDonald, Thomas Newman, Lawrence Stanley. Lawrence Stanley appears to have moved to Victoria and he married there in 1858, had three children between that time and 1864. Deserters from the Pension of Force, giving regimental number, name and date of desertion, were Edward Bannister, John Shopland, James Smith, Robert Spearing, George Thorpe, Henry Pomfrey. Daniel O'Brien absconded on 27th of July, apprehended, court-martialed at Hobart, as formerly the East India Company. As I said, Patrick Donahue had scurvy and was discharged medically unfit. Honora Hogan, wife of Matthew Hogan, in a letter, implored her husband to return to Westbury, as she had been bedridden for over a month and was being treated by Dr. McCready. She wrote that she did not want riches or my did not want riches. All my mind cares for is you, and wished her husband to be a solace to me in my trouble and sorrowful sickness. It was recommended that Hogan and another, Private John Whelan. Wheeler and Hogan's for Eliza be given one month's leave of absence, as both men had behaved well. As neither volunteered to extend their services, Captain Blaney thought that Blaney, yes, sorry, thought that they might be told at the expiration of their leave that they would not be required to rejoin the call. The tribe did not oppose the recommendation and hoped it would, that it would not cause the precedent. In fact, Private Hogan deserved before he was considered on November 10. By 1858, Matthew Hogan was dead in the land occupied by Margaret Hogan, possibly his daughter. It had been abandoned in 1862. Private Wheeler received a letter alleging incontinence of his wife. Um, <coughs> confirmations sought by local Kirk clergy. An old dictionary states lacking in uh, that uh, incontinence in this case probably means lacking in restraint, especially in sexual matters. So she might have been playing around a bit. John Whelan, a 20, age 29, and a single, had arrived for Eliza. He married Ellen Barry, Barry aged 26, in 1850 at Hobart. Ellen had been the, this is the one that's incontinence, had been the wife of Michael Berry, a private in the 53rd Regiment, who died en route to Tasmania. She already had three children, two boys um, and a girl. A fortnight prior to her marriage, Ellen placed all three children in the orphanage, and the, the records of their age are slightly different there. As I said, the Eliza had very detailed records and they had the, just about the exact day, ages for the children. 
The two younger children were released, released to their mother's care in November 1850. Ellen had a son, Walter, in 1853 at Highlands, then her former maiden name was given as Colmery. Sometimes these records are the only way we can find out the women's maiden names. Ellen Whelan, widow of John Whelan, had gained her husband's allotment of five acres and 36 perches on his deceit prior to April 1857. There is a John Whelan died at Westbury about this time, but research has shown that it's not him. Certainly by 19, uh, 19 September 1855, Ellen is de described as destitute when Henry, born Barry, now listed as Whelan, again entered the orphanage. His father is listed as dead. Two years later, John, age seven, was admitted and Walter admitted in, in 1859. So most of her children were, were in the orphanage. When she remarried in the parish church, um, this is the, something from Find My Past, and it shows the entry for John Whelan. Same again. Ellen, Ellen um, maybe Collard, maybe Collins, married Barry, married Whelan. Then married George Charles Montressa, although they already had three children. And as I mentioned, Collins, it's on most records that her name is given as Collins. Ellen and George both died in Hobart prior to 1900. Um, this is Ellen's headstone out of Cornelia Bay. Uh, George was buried in the Church of England section in 1891, and then five years later, Ellen buried in the Catholic session, apart from her husband. So it's a case where husband and wife are not buried together, which has been said. Sergeant Patrick Larkin of the 21st Regiment had lung disease and he was unfit for service over in Victoria. John Barton Campbell was allocated 10 acres of Pondfield. He went to Victoria as there was a letter from his wife Alice asking for the favour from the authorities due to her animals being impounded, impounded resulting from unmade fences. The fences were unmade due to her husband being there with the volunteer pensioners, so she was asking for a bit of help. The staff officer stated he was caused the greatest inconvenience by the irregular manner in which the pensioners behaved with respect to going and coming between the two colonies. In every instance, they overstayed their time and in many cases going without a, either leave, asked or granted. The, a further listing of 32 absconders, supplied by the staff officer Russell, requested that these should, men should be denied employment in Victoria. So a lot of unrest between the men. In July 1853, Charles McMahon, the inspector of police in Victoria, was unaware that there were some men in his police force who were enrolled pensioners. He had some to resign and made it clear that it was them. Duty to return. However, some stated that they would rather forgo their pension than return. Another wave of enrolled pensioners, numbering 200, 200 to 300, were the office, officers of the 99th Regiment, departed Hobart from Victoria the 10th of September 1853. Mrs Mary 
Morton Allport reported that the officers appeared shamefully jolly, even though their wives were to be left behind. A further division of enrolled pensioners departed Hobart Town in the steaming Yarra Yarra on the 22nd of September 1853. The rank and file travelled in the steerage while Lieutenant Isdell travelled as a cabin passenger. But that's nothing to do there. <laughs> Many of the enrolled pensioners and troops spent only three months in Victoria. Governor Denison was very eager for them to be returned as soon as possible to Tasmania. The staff, the band and the bulk of the rank and file of this regiment left Melbourne for Launceston again by the Yarra, Yarra on January 1854 and again, this is Allport Journal records, that the headquarters of the 99 had returned from Melbourne. 100 men under the command of Major Reid and Lieutenant Williams were left to enforce the 40th Regiment when they were required for service on the diggings and elsewhere. The Goldfields Commissioner, W.H. Wright, and Lieutenant Governor Charles Latrobe both praised the behaviour and contribution made by both the enrolled pensioners and Her Majesty's 99th Regiment. The troops' successor, Charles Hotham, also appealed for assistance at the end of 1854, when a rebellion of the insurgents broke out at Ballarat. They were judged to be mainly foreigners, they were well drilled and commanded. Denison again promptly sent troops to, to aid Victoria. The initial estimate of subsistence allowance for wives and children of pensions back in Tasmania was 105 women at sixpence per day for 65 days, for 60 days and 25 children at threepence per day. Although the estimate for 60 days and their work began in February, March 1852, it appears the men were still on duty as late as November 1852. Many more have stayed in Tasmania in Van Diemen's land rather than following their husbands. Though not all wives stayed behind. William Craven was doing duty at Mount Alexander and complained that his wife Catherine had come over from Van Diemen's land. She was deprived of her daily allowance of sixpence, even though she'd never been any expense to the government, either for passage, rations or otherwise. She requested that Governor Latrobe order her allowance to be paid. She was one of four women with the group, and the only one who had permission to be there was the wife of Sergeant Major Priestley. Blamey considered the conduct of the men generally was good and had no complaints of misconduct made of him of any of the women. But they were useful in the camp by doing the washing, etc., for which they were entitled their sixpence daily allowance. Oh, sorry for which they were paid by individuals employing them, so they were being paid to do the washing. He did not feel they were entitled to their sixpence daily allowance like those who had stayed behind in Van Diemen's land. Deserters or those discharged for misconduct were supposed to have their names submitted to the Secretary of War. Their pensions were to stop, their land and cottage was to be forfeited. Once they had left Van Diemen's land, it was difficult to keep control of the pensioners. In June 1853, there were 23 men absent without leave in Victoria, and Frederick Russell, the staff officer of pensions in Van Diemen's Land, did not have any information on them, though they were reputedly still in Victoria, using the aliases and employed by the place as constables, as they were paid more as a, they were paid more as a constable than an enrolled pensioner. Michael Farley used the name Michael Thurley was in force at, in the force at Heathcote Camp. John Keane, ex 95th Regiment, admitted he was employed as a drill sergeant of the police at Castlemaine. George Mason was said to be at the Gold Commissioner's tent, and, Frank, and Frederick Hurst had commenced business as an engraver. At the time, he was unable to travel, being insufficiently recovered from an attack of liver disease. Some of these people stayed in Victoria. The Lockmans had been abandoned between 1853 and 1855, and certainly by 1857. Perhaps the failure of the scheme to settle some of these areas can be found in the comment in 1850 in the Hobart Town Courier. 
The mode in which these men have been treated, we are sorry to say, reflects great discredit upon local authorities. They came at it under printed regulations from the Home Guards, many of them with wives and children, with orders for land and allowances for land. With orders, sorry, with orders for land. Have I had a pleasant place? They came out under printed regulations from the Home Guards, many with them with wives and children, with orders for land and allowances for house. A show of providing them with land from two to five acres, barren land in interior townships. Have not many sections of government land been sold since their arrival? Their treatment is irrecordably consolable with any motive except the desire to stop any further immigration of this kind. They are old soldiers who have faithfully served their country. They are looked upon as unwholesome intruders, keeping out free, or, uh, free immigrants. One of the pensioners complained that his pension was so small that he had trouble subsisting on it. The governor observed that if he went to work on the roads, there would be a ration for him. There's on it for you, he says, and as the office, our staff says, those whose father contributed to save our Indian Empire must herd with thieves, burglars and murderers to gain a crust. Certainly a report of 1859 confirmed this when it was stated that the, with the exception of Westbury and Port Signet, the land made available for the royal pensioners was of the most inferior quality. Um, that street in Richmond is very undulating and uh, not very good for where it was, where they were supposed to settle. And if you look at Oaklands, the Oaklands land, um, very dry there. Spring Hill Bottom. Um, it's located southwest from Colebrook on the range that separates the Coal River Valley from Kempton and the Midland Highway. About six to seven kilometres from Colebrook, take the road to Yarlington and return. Three quarters of the pensioners who settled at Spring Hill Bottom were Irish. They didn't really succeed there. The land was unsuitable to grow crops. It was hilly, stony and heavily timbered. Much of it was underlain with sandstone, notably for notable for reducing droughty soils and low, of low fertility. Five acre lots were too small to be viable and trees needed to be cleared before being cultivated. There was a struggle to support families with poor quality land, inexperience of, with local conditions, lack of capital and competition with convicts for employment. It was also, has also been suggested that half the pensioners did not have the skill as landowners. And these are some of the blocks up at Yarlington. With no work available, some of them turned to crime and even illicit stills. Often they ended up in jail. The family were often destitute, poverty prevailed, and the family needed a helping hand. In 1870, there were 10 families living in the area, and by 1891, there was only one family left, so the families gradually all moved away. In 1853, with the land being sterile, John Wright abandoned his cottage. The building was suggested as suitable for a school as one, as the one at Jerusalem was thought to be too distant for the 38 pensioner children to attend. The parish priest recommended a schoolmaster, the pensioner William Ryan, and suggested he would be competent to teach reading, writing and arithmetic. 29 years earlier, um, William Ryan signed his enlistment papers with a cross, so somehow he gained an education somewhere we hope. The school was used for 15 years before lack of pupils caused closure. Ooh, really um, these are some of the um, Spring Hill block at the bottom of 
pictures I took of quite a few years ago. Pension houses of Westbury. Cute little cottages. And again looking at um, Rocky Hills. Richmond, the allotments. I've showed you that one. Why has that come up again? Um, that one's down at Port Signet. Quite a few down there. And um, they were affected by the 1853 bushfires down at Richmond. Uh, down at uh, Signet. Tynan's Cottage, quite notable as, as is Convoy's. And quite a few of the children at times, as I've mentioned, went into the orphanage. I think I was about, um, let's see if I can find it. Anyway, um, Cornelius O'Keefe, there's a picture of him, or some Tess ancestry. I started with this looking for George Coates and his family, so I were related to my husband's family. From detailed research, my husband's great great grandmother, I found links to another family. Through thorough research, family members registered various births, deaths, and were witnesses to marriages. I established the family and a death certificate noted that the father had been a pensioner guard. His burial confirmed this, confirmed his regiment that the family were at the Brickfields for um, the hiring depot for convicts. And it was only his um, burial register, on the burial register, he was buried at um, Campbell Street, Holy Trinity, Campbell Street, noted he was in the 19th Regiment of Foot, so I went a little bit more. Uh, it wasn't until I looked at all possible leads on the family that I found his son was a policeman. And it was these records in archives that gave the ship of arrival. Going to the ship of arrival, I had a look at the surgeon's report and I found his sister listed in the surgeon's report so that I knew that family had come out on the Pistonji Bamanji. That ship and um, actually this chap, this pensioner, he died 1857, I think. But I found different bits and pieces for this record. Um, and the Bangalore, the next ship, based on Jubamanji and the Bangalore, those two ships. The, there aren't even any names listed as there are for the other ships. And I'll leave it for that, but quickly. Um, Australian Joint Copying Project. Anyone, everyone heard of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a project uh, where the records of the National Archives England, London, um, British National Archives, no, they're just na National Archives, records that were pertaining to Australia from, eight, um, yeah, pertaining to Australia, from 1948 to about 2000 were microfilmed. And these include, include the War Office, WO22 up there, and it shows you the outpension records for the Royal Hospital Chelsea of Tasmania up underlined. And again, there's some more there. So that's where you find your military pensioner records. WI 22 slash 391 and that one's uh, WI 22 one 382 right backwards, yeah, 3919. Oh, okay. I did find how to build a pensioner's cottage. Mm -hmm. It's in the archives somewhere. 
I said the cost was 19 pound, five and six bits, 20 pound. Okay. I had to prepare the ground and post, etc. Making glaze, two sashes of nylon lights, the windows, each eight by 10 lights, fix the same with necessary strips. So the instructions are there to do. And I mentioned um, the water hole up at Lake Dal Dal Dalverton, the pensioners water hole, and this is a painting of Bellevue. And that's from Allport Library. Unknown artist. There's some articles on military pensioners, the Eliza, they are on um, Tasmanian Family History Society journals. I'll keep going and if you want to ask Clayton for any of those, that's fine. Um, that's one of them on the Eliza. And it listed so all, all that information and there's nothing for those two ships I mentioned. Um, another one for the William Jardine. There's a couple of other to cook in Thra. I've published histories. Um, this is on the Tas Library site. Libraries Tas, if you go into family history, you'll find military and you'll find some references. Um, <laughs> oh, that's one I did for the Tasmanian history. It's got my name on. Mm -hmm. Must have done it. Can't remember. Long time ago. And there's another one I did. That was the Papers and Proceedings Tasmania Historical Research Association. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. But if you've got any questions on those references, let me know. Mm -hmm. If you can stay back and ask me, that's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hope you enjoyed it. I would like to give you up to have. Oh, thank you. No, I'd just like to thank Marie for her talk.